particular issue um, in the public uh, domain had. So he divided up into these different um, uh, stages. Um, stage one was the beginning before people really started to realize it was a problem. Um, it existed, but uh, it wasn't in the public consciousness. Then suddenly people started realizing there was a problem and, uh, and uh, that they needed to do something about it. There's a lot of enthusiasm about it, so that's stage two up there. Um, and then uh, it entered into the third stage, which was when people started to realize, well, you know, this is a problem, it's going to cost an awful lot, uh, it's probably going to involve some major changes in society even, and so the enthusiasm started to wane very gradually, and then uh, that uh, carried on, and so in the fourth stage there was a, a, a decline of interest even further, um, it, people realised it was probably a, a, a too expensive to address, too difficult, so they lost interest in it, and then the fifth stage of course was the, the post-problem where it sort of disappeared from the, the public consciousness again. And it just made me think, well, has, uh, has, is the red alert, uh, sorry, is the red issue, red plus, um, whereabouts is it on this, this curve? Um, and if it is on the curve, then uh, can, somewhere on the curve, then can we do something about it? <clears throat> so we can think about whether the, the window of opportunity for red is closing. And I'm, I'm only posing this as a question rather than, a, than an argument at this point. Um, for a number of reasons why, uh, that people have put forward why there could be a window that is a uh, window of opportunity that is nearing uh, closure. You may disagree, of course, but one of them is the, the fact that uh, as a proportion, the emissions coming from uh, forest de uh, deforestation is actually declining in terms of the total global net emissions. This is not because the problem has gone away, although it's a, it's a great way of trying to solve a problem, but. Um, the, the main sources of emissions have gone up, that's the, the uh, emissions from the fossil fuel sector. So, uh, so over the period of the project even, which has been three, uh, three and a half years, um, the estimates of uh, contribution of deforestation have gone down from 20% originally, or near 20%, down to a figure near 10% now. Now part of this is due, of course, to better ways of estimating it, but also the other part is because the emissions from the fossil fuel sector has increased over that time. So you could argue that one way of getting rid of a problem is to make another problem worse. Um, cap and trade is another thing that's been very slow to develop. Uh, it's starting to take off a little bit now, but there has been no demand for credits, uh, or very little demand. The price of carbon has been very, very low up until now, so uh, there's, that's uh, caused a problem, I think, for, for red. Um, and also, people are starting to realize that it's uh, the whole uh, red approach is very, uh, very much a hostage to the fluctuations and the vagaries of, uh, of other things going on in international uh, processes, so for example commodity prices such as food and so on. Um, and uh, also people start to realise the cost of it all, uh, the transaction cost which weren't originally taken into account very much. Um, in some cases it's the use of overseas development, uh, development uh, assistance funds going in, go, being switched and so that's taking it away from other areas of development. In some cases it's seen as unfair as just allowing Western countries to carry on emitting um, at the expense of developing countries. And I think probably the one thing that uh, people are really starting to realise is that the, the whole approach is quite complicated. Uh, this recent report that came out from the Forest Carbon Partnership facil uh, facility, as some of you would have seen, a comment, one of the comments in the summary of that was that red is far much more expensive and complex and protracted than was anticipated at the time of the um, FCPF's launch. So no doubt that it is, is quite a complicated uh, uh, scheme. Um, so to try and make sense of all that, um, most of you will be familiar with the forest transition curve, which uh, is a, a kind of a, an empirical curve that uh, a lot of uh, countries undergoing deforestation historically have, have tended to follow. Very much an empirical curve. It's kind of an environmental Kuznets curve if, uh, for those uh, economists of you here. And so one of the things we've tried to do in the project and elsewhere have been to, to try and understand some of the underlying drivers and reasons for this particular curve. Um, and particularly at the end there, which uh, some countries are starting to reforest, and trying to understand the reasons behind that is quite important if we're trying to uh, increase the amount of carbon in the landscape. But the key thing, I, I won't go into all the details of this because you can probably read the reports from the, the project, um, but one of the key things is that agriculture, uh, both uh, subsistence and um, commercial, is, is responsible for about 80% of the total deforestation occurring today, something, something like that. So agriculture is a big, big driver of it all. 
And that's not going to go away. If you look at this uh, diagram, this, uh, this, um, this graph uh, from a study that came out last year, and um, Tillman's group uh, calculated uh, the protein and carbohydrate demand for the future, extrapolating out to uh, 2050, and um, they have found that uh, with a change in lifestyles and rising incomes, that uh, far from it being a 70% increase in food production required, it's near 100%, in some cases even more than that. So the food uh, issue is not going to go away, and that has to be taken into account, I think, when we're considering the drivers of uh, deforestation too. So one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Eric Lamban, in fact two of them, uh, and Patrick Mayfroy at the University of Belgium have been involved in this project right from the start, have looked at some of the factors, um, whether it's possible to increase food production uh, at the same time as increasing forests. And they found a few countries that in fact have, um, some of these are quite well known, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Bhutan, Vietnam, and they've come up with a number of reasons why they've been able to increase both food production and increase the, uh, the, cover, the forest cover in those countries. Uh, I won't go through them now uh, because of the, the time, but um, essentially one of the key things coming out of this was that in fact um, some of that increase in forest production, forest cover, was actually coming from exportation of uh, deforestation abroad. So they increased their uh, importation of both food and timber products, and around about half of the increase in forest cover could actually be attributed to just exporting deforestation else, elsewhere. So it's a complicated thing, and uh, so uh, the next thing we tried to do was to understand more of the, the drive. Well, having understood the drivers, we then tried to understand what um, instruments could be used and deployed to, to address some of these drivers. And one of my colleagues um, in the, the project, Joita Gupta from the University of Amsterdam, Free University of Amsterdam, uh, catalogued a number of um, uh, instruments that could be used against various drivers. And this is all being summarized in a book that is just uh, literally published last week. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any copies from the publishers yet, but there is um, a flyer at the back of the, the room, so if you're interested in purchasing this book at a 20% reduced price, then take one of, them, uh, one of those flyers home. But essentially, she tried to catalogue the instruments involved and uh, to match these with particular drivers that, we, that we'd identify. Um, so moving down from the, um, the kind of uh, the, the global level, we then started to look in more detail at some of the dynamics going on at the forest agriculture interface where people were deforesting for various reasons, generally to, to earn a livelihood. And some of the economic modeling again showed that the system is very complex, that um, you can't really generalize uh, uh, to, from one situation to another and that you really have to take each, each case and each uh, country, each, each site within each country uh, by itself and look at it on its own merits. And so some of the work going on within Peru that we had, for example, was find, using um, uh, computable general equilibrium models found that, uh, that uh, landowners uh, benefited, whether they be present or, or absentee land, landowners. But in fact, a lot of the people there within a region, within a village or within the, the, um, the local community would actually uh, disbenefit from RED because um, uh, of the, the way in which um, uh, the increased returns from, from land due to red payments would force up uh, wages, uh, sorry, force down wages and, um, and uh, increase rents on land. So it's, it's quite a complex situation. I know this has been done in other places before, but uh, it can, there, there are winners and losers in all of this. So those who own land uh, can generally uh, benefit. Uh, but even then, not always, uh, whereas those who don't have land, of course, uh, can, can, uh, can suffer. So I think the key message out of all of this is that uh, there are no general messages on the ground, I think, that can readily extrapolate from one area to the next, that each one has to be considered on its own merit. It depends on the balance of uh, uh, landowners, uh, landless, uh, amount of labour available, external prices, the degree which the system is connected to the outside world, and so on. I think one of the things that... Um, we started to realize early on in the project then was that um, it's not a wholly economic story as, as perhaps uh, RED has been, or at least the focus has been uh, largely up until now. But um, what we then started tried to investigate was how other factors, other, other uh, influences on human decision making could actually be, be harnessed. And we started thinking about uh, this framework, four eyes framework, which some of you have probably heard of before. 
um, looking at uh, or trying to categorize factors that actually influence people's decisions. And so we've talked about incentives, it's largely economic, although it doesn't have to be, but also things like information and um, identity, which means how people uh, perceive themselves in their community, uh, belonging, um, aspects or, or characteristics of pride uh, and, and shame, uh, the converse of that, and also the institutes and the trust uh, institutions and the trust that they, they might have in those institutions. And one of my colleagues at C4, uh, Mary Panomo, was uh, uh, made an attempt at trying to uh, develop a, a kind of a, a, an expression, I guess, if you like, for, for altruism to, to look at uh, things going beyond just pure economics and to try and calculate or estimate uh, uh, the, the degree to which people might make decisions based on um, other factors. And so he came up with this, this kind of equation here. Um, it became, I think, apparent during the, the, over the, the length of the project that we really need to have to think of things in a, in a systems way. Uh, particularly uh, relating uh, or realizing that it's, it's a socio-ecological system we're dealing with, with people involved, uh, biophysical processes going on, and uh, social and economic uh, uh, processes as well. And so it's not just enough to consider only just the economics or just the biophysics, but uh, to, to, to think of everything and across the whole landscape as well, not just a, a, a forest uh, focus because given that the dry, large driver, or major driver of deforestation is agriculture itself, then of course we need to uh, consider the drivers on that. And so uh, we've tried to categorize here in this diagram that you can see the linkages between agriculture, between forests, between wetlands, and also between the communities. And there are flows of information between all of these, um, and flows of material as well, so carbon, nitrogen, and, and other things too. So if you press one of them down or try to manipulate one, then it's going to have some influence on the other. If you try to reduce deforestation, then it's just going to push agriculture somewhere else. So we, we have to think of all these linkages somehow. Um, intensification was one of the things we, we considered. So the idea here, it's been around for a long time, from Norman Borlaug back in the 60s or so, um, was the, the hypothesis is that if you increase inten or intensify agricultural production, then you relieve pressure on the forests, if you um, are producing more from a given piece of agricultural land. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that. There's a lot of complexity involved, and uh, uh, essentially it uh, hinges around whether the system is, is closed or open or linked to global markets. If it's a closed system, then yes, it can, uh, can have an effect that if you increase production on one particular area, um, you're producing more food, people can consume that, and uh, therefore the, there's less need to, uh, to, to clear forests to do that. But however, if it's, if it's linked to the, to the global system, uh, often, particularly if you're, you're dealing with an increase in um, uh, commodities, uh, then uh, obviously then um, if there's increased production in that particular area, um, that uh, increases the profitability and therefore reduces uh, even more clearing. And then you've got things like people moving in and out of the system as well, which makes it even more complex. So, so it, it's not as simple as, as we think it is uh, at, at first, first glance. So just to summarize then the last couple of slides, um, I just posed a question here, well, what has, what, what has RED achieved so far? And these are just my thoughts um, based on the experiences we've had with the, the project. You may think of others or you may even disagree with some of them. But, uh, I think it has given us a much better idea of the drivers of deforestation. We, we, um, we understand, I think, uh, more of the processes going on, both at the, the global level and the local, realize that uh, there are underlying drivers as well as um, proximate ones very close to the, to the scene of deforestation. I think we've made a lot of progress in the methodologies involved in measuring deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions and changes in carbon stocks. And uh, Lou Vachot will be talking about some of that uh, shortly. We made progress on estimating baselines and reference levels, um, MRV, and uh, it's getting better figures for emissions from tropical peatlands in particular. Um, as I've been saying, I think we've realized that it's a landscape problem, not just a forest problem, that we need to consider all the other land uses and the linkages and trade-offs between them, um, and how to deal with these underlying drivers in these other sectors. I think we're starting to realize, too, that it's not all economics. Uh, that's, of course, a large part of it, there's no doubt. But there are other things as well, and uh, Miner will be talking about some of that uh, in, in his talk, that there are a range of solutions needed. And I think most of all, it uh, really has created an awareness of, um, of, the, the, uh, of, of, of tropical forestry in general amongst the, the global population. I think uh, starting to emerge a concept that 
uh, you know, global forests really do belong to, to, to us all, not just to the particular countries they happen to be uh, situated in, this concept of the global forest. So lastly then, I just wonder whether it's possible, going back to that slide I had right at the beginning, um, where uh, we talked about the forest transition, particularly that um, bit at the end where it's starting to come up again, um, can we actually, at the global level, uh, 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 try and promote a, a global forest transition? And I've listed a number of items there which I won't go into details about, but um, through the different classifications of forestry, the different types of, uh, of trees where trees are grown, um, can we actually start to, to increase the, uh, the forest cover globally again? So we can look at things we can do to the natural forests themselves, uh, natural regeneration, plantations, uh, promoting agroforestry in uh, the uh, forest margins where there's um, agriculture going on at the moment, but we can perhaps uh, get synergies between growing trees and, and agriculture there. And then can we also uh, increase the intensification of agriculture um, as well to relieve pressure on the forest? And then on the demand side, can we uh, create a demand for carbon credits um, with uh, better cap and trade systems, tighter, uh, tighter uh, caps, and therefore uh, increase the price of carbon, which may provide a better incentive for people to invest in carbon, and then also change people's uh, perceptions and um, uh, uh, um, preferences for consumer products from, from the forest itself, but also from the agriculture that surrounds it. So uh, uh, buying food, for example, that only comes from uh, sustainable science. So uh, that's, uh, that's all, that's all I've got to say.